My name is Ben Corey, and I'm gradually getting grayer and fatter and uh, more curmudgeonly at VMware, uh, working on vSphere Integrated Containers, which is um, my project. And what I'm here to talk to you today about is the benefits of containers. Now, I just literally did a presentation, a lightboard presentation called What is a Container? So if you're uncertain about what a container is, or if you want a refresher on that, uh, it might be worth going back and looking at that, because I'll be referring to a number of the things that I mentioned in that uh, presentation in this one. And one of the things that I called out in that presentation uh, was that quite often I think we use the word container as a bit of a catch-all for, a, for a number of different things. And that can actually cause some confusion. So what I want to do is I want to call out those distinctions that I made in the previous uh, presentation. The distinctions that I made were runtime, image, and automation. Now, this whole area of um, uh, automation uh, is you know, one that uh, I think a lot of people uh, are really starting to uh, understand in terms of the benefits of containers. Uh, we talked previously about Dockerfile and how useful Dockerfile is. Um, you know, being able to express an environment in a text file is, is, is pretty useful. Um, but it goes way beyond the Docker file. Um, you know, the, the, the whole move towards uh, continuous integration, continuous integration pipelines, um, plugins with um, uh, different kinds of, um, uh, of, of CI systems, um, plugins with um, you know, development environments. Um, containers are really greasing the wheels of uh, this development pipeline. And a lot of that you know, could be grouped under this whole uh, question of automation. Um, images we talked about, remember we mentioned in the previous presentation that um, an image is um, the binary state of a potential container. Right? So an image is all of the binary dependencies that a container needs when it's uh, actually uh, instantiated inside of an operating system at runtime. So when we think about the benefits of containers, because the word container is, means a bunch of different things, um, what I want to do is actually split up these benefits into two key areas. Key area number one, uh, I would actually call, let's get a different color here, I would actually call <clears throat> operational efficiency. Okay, how do containers help us to be more operationally efficient? And I've already talked a little bit about how automation is really helping to grease the wheels in terms of the development life cycle. Um, but I'm, we're going to look at, at operational efficiency first. But I think runtime really is its own area, right? This area is, well, um, you know, what are all the benefits I get from the container workflow, from working with containers, from the container, um, you know, from all of the things that I can do right up until the point at which the container is instantiated in some operating system somewhere. At that point, what benefits am I getting, right? So I'm going to divide them into, into two. So let's think about operational efficiency. Now, we talked about uh, automation and the way that um, you know, containers can kind of flow through systems from a developer's laptop into a registry, out into uh, maybe Jenkins, and then out again, and into somewhere else. This whole pipeline that we speak about <clears throat> is greatly facilitated by portability. Portability. Now, um, portability of containers, what does that really mean? Well, what it means is if I build a container on my laptop, uh, I can run that container anywhere that there is a compatible operating system and uh, an, a compatible control plane. So in the Docker case, provided that Docker Engine is running on, let's say, Linux somewhere. I mean, I know we have Docker for Windows now. But let's say it's running on Linux somewhere. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's running in, in, in the cloud. It doesn't matter whether it's running on my data center. It doesn't matter whether it's running in vSphere, whether it's running in a VM on my laptop. It's, it's, it's a portable abstraction. right? And it's the Docker image uh, format that, to some extent, facilitates this portability. Because the Docker image, uh, as, as we talked about in the last presentation, encapsulates all of the binary dependencies, a lot of the configuration, some metadata. Everything is packaged up as a container so that we can then shift it around and run it on a system and not worry about what dependencies are installed on that system, necessarily. Right? Not in the same way as we used to, at least. Um, all we need to think about is, OK, well, is it a well-configured system with Docker on it? Right? I mean, there's security considerations and other things, but that's really the, the degree of, of, of our concern. 
That's portability. So the image format is itself, I think, a significant advantage. Well, what benefits do we get from the image format? Well, remember we talked uh, in the previous uh, presentation about a few of those benefits. Um, the fact that every image is just a diff, right? It's a snapshot. So it allows us to be much more efficient with how we move binaries around because we're only ever moving around diffs. We're not necessarily moving around entire, um, you know, entire stacks as single files. Well, that's, that's, that really helps us to be operationally efficient. We talked about the, um, the, uh, the hierarchy, right? That you can basically, the, the images have a parent-child relationship and you have effectively a tree of images and that's potentially also really, really helpful because if I want to identify uh, a particular image that has a problem, let's say a vulnerability or a, a fix or a patch, and it has children that are going to be impacted by that patch, well, I can immediately determine which of the applications that I'm running are the applications that contain that flaw or that vulnerability because by definition, they're the children of this image in the tree. So if I fix that image and build that entire subtree, I've hopefully patched everything that matters, right? So the, this whole notion of this, 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 this parent-child relationship with images, when it comes to actually managing, um, for example, many companies like to have um, blessed VMs, right? They'll have a, 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 you know, a whole department that, that says, okay, this is the Linux you will use, and it runs this, and it, it does X, Y, or Z. Well, the image format, the container image format, allows us to do similar things to that, but to a much more granular and much more flexible degree, right? Because we can say, well, this is our blessed, uh, this is our blessed Debian, and then on top of that, well, this is our blessed Debian plus X, and this is our blessed Debian plus X plus Y, right? And then on top of that, you may build whatever you like. But it allows us to be much more uh, flexible about about how we package things. So I think that's another big advantage. Now, of course, um, with uh, the image, the Docker image. Um, again, I, you know, I, I, sometimes we talk generically about containers. Oftentimes we talk specifically about Docker because that's the most common use case. Um, registries, are, um, the Docker registries, are a big part of why this uh, Docker image format is also um, becoming really, really uh, interesting to people. And in fact, it's worth noting that um, many third parties now are starting to ship their software to vendors uh, to, to, to customers as Docker images. They're like, oh, no, actually, we really like this Docker image format. This is really working for us. And part of this is down to these benefits we talked about, partly also the registry. Well, what benefits do we get with a registry? Well, there are companies furiously innovating in this space right now, particularly in the area of security, right? So role-based access control, for example. I can define who runs what image and on what endpoint. Right? That's a really powerful thing to be able to do. Uh, vulnerability scanning. So, scanning, scanning. Vulnerability scanning is big business these days. Um, you know, uh, do, you know, I've got this image from somewhere. Someone, one of my developers built this image. Do I know what's in it? No, maybe not, right? So, so vulnerability scanning is really powerful because it allows me to know exactly what is in it. And I may then even be able to apply policies around who can deploy what with certain types of vulnerability. Again, the question of image provenance, and uh, by inference, the, the, the whole question of signing images, right? Do I know where this image came from? Is this, can I trust the place that this image came from? So there's a ton of things that are coming uh, around this area of security and, and access control in the area of the, the image format and the registry that, again, massively helping with operational efficiency and, and how we manage uh, the provisioning of applications. Um, I would say that another big thing is uh, control, right? Control over all sorts of things. We've talked about control over the life cycle of a container, the control over uh, how the container is configured and packaged and, and presented and all those other things, um, but also control over infrastructure. We talked about how you can use Docker to manipulate networks, and create networks, attach containers to networks. We can use our Docker client to allocate um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, persistent storage. Um, we can use it to do all sorts of things. And actually, when you sit down with a Docker client and you use it for the first time, and you realize that just about everything you want to do with infrastructure is just a couple of commands away, 
it's, you get a little dopamine rush. It's, it's, a, it's a really, really nice experience. And I think that accounts for a lot of why people really loved Docker in the first place, was it was just that, that, that fluidity of being able to express what you want with infrastructure and control it. Um, that's, a, that's a big part of, uh, of, of the operational efficiency, again, that you get with, with uh, containers. Um, so uh, where am I going next? Uh, OK, state management. State management. Now, state management, as far as I'm concerned, um, really has two facets to it. There's the facet of the state that your application writes or reads. Um, and containers kind of force you to think about that in a way that a, a traditional VM doesn't. <clears throat> so by that I mean what a container has really three kinds of storage. It has the images that are, that are presented, which are fundamentally read-only. It has the volumes that you can create, which are read-write and persist beyond the lifecycle of the container. And then you have the container file system, which is also read-write, typically, although you can configure it to be read-only, <clears throat> and does not persist beyond the lifecycle of the container. So, so when you're actually deploying an application as a container, it forces you to think about, OK, well, what is my persistent state? What is my ephemeral state? And where do I want that to go? And is it going somewhere that's backed up? Right? It really forces you to think about how you're managing state in terms of the application state. But there's also another uh, area of state management that I think is really significant when it comes to uh, thinking about the container model. And that's this notion of, um, of um, um, uh, reconfiguration, for want of a better word. So one of the things we've become very used to doing in production is having long-running things that we gradually poke with a stick every once in a while and do something to, right? So, you know, those of you that, that, uh, that use Chef and Puppet and, and these other things, um, you know, you'll write a Chef recipe and you'll have maybe 100 instances of an application and you need to update it, you need to reconfigure it, you need to make some change. Okay, so update it. Hopefully that's worked on all these things. And what we're doing when we do that is we're taking our workloads through state transitions. So we're going from state A to state B. Maybe tomorrow I'm going to take it from state B to state C. Maybe a week later, it's going to go from state C to state D. And that's all. That sounds fine. That sounds great. Um, but this takes little account often for the fact that state A may, in fact, go to state B fine. But then it may go to state C1, which is a slight derivative of state C. It's not quite exactly the same as state C because something went wrong or something was slightly different about this node or it's a Tuesday, whatever it might be. And then the script that you wrote to take it from C to D doesn't really know quite how to deal with C1. Uh, and you know, it, you know, the probability of that, su that succeeding is, is lower. So you've got to think very defensively about, well, is it actually in state C? Right? And so, so this, whole, this whole notion of taking long-running things through various state transitions uh, is, is, is useful. There's no question it's useful. But it's also error-prone. And you know, there are cases where we just end up giving up on things because they're now fundamentally unconfigurable, and they've just, we just have to restart them. Now, where the container model um, uh, comes from is it basically says, well, we should just never do that. We should just always restart them. Right? There, should not, there should not be any state transition in terms of configuration changes or, or patches or anything like that. Not to say that you can't do that. I mean, you can, you can make it do that. But the way it's designed is it's really designed to be torn down and, uh, and brought back up again. So any update, any change you make, it's very much like a sealed appliance, right? You bring it up, you do something, it, it functions for a while, you need to update it, and you literally just swap it out. You replace it. So state management, again, two, two facets to that, I think. Uh, the facet of application state and the facet of, of, of configuration state. Um, that's probably enough for now in terms of the operational efficiency, unless I happen to think of anything uh, while we're talking about runtime efficiency. But let's move over to this side of the, of the, of the board and talk about, well, OK, given that we've got all these benefits uh, of uh, creating containers and creating uh, container images, when we actually go to provision them into, uh, into a, a guest OS, into a runtime of some kind, what benefits are we expecting at the moment that those, that those start up and at the moment that we, that we get those things running? Well, I would say the most obvious benefit that people often point to, uh, particularly when you're at 
a conference and they show a thousand instances of something starting at once. Um, containers are very dynamic. There's no question that you know the ability to be able to start something up very, very quickly and then make it go away again very, very quickly. Um, the ability to do, do transactional workloads in containers. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the whole dynamic nature of the container runtime, the speed and efficiency with which you can you know, work with containers is very, very useful. Now, it's not necessary for everything, but it's certainly very, very useful in many cases. And it kind of, it kind of tempts us towards more of these stateless, uh, horizontally scaling um, you know, farms of, 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 of simple small services, which is the Nirvana we're all uh, saying that uh, we're all going to be doing in last year, next year, whenever. Um, and actually, let's write down horizontal scaling. Now, I'm not saying that just because you use containers, you're automatically going to do horizontal scaling. But I think there has been an interesting shift um, in the last, um, well, the last five years, maybe, as we've moved from VMs towards containers in, in, in our thinking. Um, VMs were very much oftentimes about vertical scaling. You know, if you wanted more performance from your Java workload, what did you do? Well, you doubled the size of the heap, right? And then, and then doubled the size of the VM and added a little bit extra and hoped for the best. Um, well, with containers, you know, again, that's not typically the way that we, that we think, or at least the way that we're encouraged to think, partly because the more that we're encouraged to think about containers as being stateless services, um, and the fact that containers are built on top of um, an IaaS layer that very typically doesn't have um, the, you know, the, a lot of the complex, complex um, scheduling capabilities that something like vSphere has. I mean, vSphere has, um, you know, it has, uh, uh, you know, HA capabilities, it has live migration, it has all of those things. All those things are great for stateful workloads because to be able to live migrate something that's stateful, oh, it's just wonderful, right? You don't, you know, it's, it's and, and all of these things that we spent all these years building into our platform work really great with stateful workloads. But once you get towards stateless workloads and you, you want to deploy them to um, multiple nodes of a thing, right, horizontal scaling is such a natural fit with that model. Um, and, you know, you'll see, um, you know, Kubernetes and Docker Data Center, all of these uh, frameworks have notions of replicas and, and instances and, and, you know, and, and rolling updates. And all of this is, 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 is moved towards horizontal scaling. So as part and parcel of uh, the horizontal scaling that we're talking about, <clears throat> we also find ourselves ending up talking about scheduling and clustering. And again, clustering, again, when you look at frameworks like Kubernetes, Docker Data Center, all about scheduling and clustering, right? You know, we grow the size of a cluster by adding nodes to it. That, that's how it works. So again, containers don't necessarily give us these particular benefits, but we, they kind of necessitate these capabilities is the best way to describe it. Um, so if I want to move towards more of a container model, uh, I often find myself having to think about moving towards horizontal scaling, uh, scheduling, clustering, all these things. That's not to say, by the way, that uh, uh, virtual, sorry, that, that putting legacy workloads uh, into containers is necessarily a bad idea. And one of the presentations I'm going to be doing after this is actually talking about, uh, we're seeing more and more of this, talking about why companies actually want to containerize legacy workloads, the benefits they get from it, uh, and how we can help them to do that, right? So not every container workload has to be you know, super stateless and, and super small and super scalable. Um, bare metal is another interesting um, item on this list in that I think the containers make bare metal and clusters of bare metal much more manageable. If that's what you want to use, I mean, sometimes containers have been called like poor man's virtualization. I can see why that would be, uh, why people would say that. Um, because actually a container host uh, has very many of the same facets as a hypervisor. Right? It has a control plane, it has a kernel, it has network virtualization, it has storage virtualization, uh, it, you know, it has this, this sandbox construct that has, uh, you know, it's, it's a private namespace with resource constraints. There are so many similarities between the two. Um, and so, you know, if you're a company and, and what you need to do is you need to spin up thousands and thousands of instances of a thing, uh, a bare metal silo running some kind of uh, container engine 
may well be exactly what you need. Uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, presentations from, um, from uh, Shopify who have done exactly that. They have you know, their entire um, application built into containers. They have an on-premise data center, and they just scale it up and scale it up and scale it up. Um, and if you're running thousands and thousands of the same thing, I can see why that would be, why that would be uh, worthwhile. Most of these VMware's customers, however, are still running lots and lots of different things, right? Everything from Windows desktops to analytics workloads to databases to uh, Hadoop to, uh, you know, you name it. They're, 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 they're virtualized just about everything. And so in that heterogeneous world of virtualization, there is still very much a place for, uh, for the traditional VM model. Um, but... I can see why you know the bare, containers make bare metal easy to consume. <laughs> is is the, the way I would put it. Um, so uh, the final thing, actually, I would add to this, which I probably should have added at the start because it's one of the more obvious things to to add, is consolidation. And by consolidation, what I mean is that you can run with containers. You can run multiple of a thing. Inside of, uh, inside of an operating system and have those things be isolated from each other, right? Uh, in the same way as you can run multiple processes in an operating system, they're not isolated in, in the same way. With containers, you can run multiple containers in the same operating system. Now, because they're sharing a kernel, you get potentially significant consolidation benefits. In the same way as when people went from uh, physical to virtual and they found that they got consolidation benefits, very similar, you know, if you go from um, containers, from, from, from you know, a, a, a legacy workload to a containerized workload, you may find you get consolidation benefits. So I think it's fair to say that um, these runtime benefits are typically like where people are going when they think about deploying containers, uh, uh, you know, on, on the runtime side. Um, and it, it's, it's useful to think about these as, as se separate things, partly because um, what a lot of companies are trying to do today is they're trying to just get a handle on this stuff here, right? I mean, they're, they're, this stuff feels kind of scary and a little bit out there. This stuff, they want to get their heads around. They want to get a lot of the benefits and the advantages of, 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 of the operational efficiency aspect. And the reason that's an interesting distinction is because with vSphere integrated containers, as we'll be exploring in, in the subsequent presentation, the, 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 the promise of Vic is you get all of this, all of this operational efficiency, but applied to vSphere as a backend rather than Linux and containers as a backend. Um, so you get all the operational efficiency and the workflow benefits and everything, everything that you see here, but you don't have to think about this piece being a different model or a model that you're not used to because behind the curtain, it's just vSphere infrastructure and VMs and vSphere networks, vSphere storage. Um, so we'll explore much more about that when we get into the Vic presentation. But for now, hopefully that was interesting. And uh, see you again soon.